Sup, Gloomers? So we now have more information on the Angry Faces cards and perks. And oh boy, do I want to talk about it relentlessly. Personally, I think a lot of people who enjoyed the Doom Stalker in first edition will really enjoy it in second. But I think that there were some people that really weren't sold on the class that might be able to either enjoy the little sniper style more, but also the summon build, which kind of had the most busted cards and the absolute worst cards like the level 9 summon was like insane out of all the summons in the game one of the best and it had some of the worst lost summons throughout the game ultimately that's all been adjusted and looks a lot better now so without further ado let's just look into the cards If you want to be kept up to date with all things Gloomhaven, including Gloomhaven 2nd Edition, Frosthaven, and all sorts of stuff, including a Let's Play that we're going to be doing, uh, please subscribe and be sure to like. It really helps out. And if you really want to support us, consider joining Patreon. We also have a Discord if you want to shitpost and talk about Gloomhaven sometimes. So first, I personally think that the first thing to talk about the Doomstalker is Dooms. There were primarily two Dooms that you used primarily in 1st Edition. That was Race to the Grave and Reign of Arrows. Um, making the target suffer two damage a turn. It was actually really interesting because you could time this. You could just screw over particularly annoying enemies such as living spirits or flame demons, but also you could just put it on an enemy you wanted to ignore and just uh, worked on something else. It was, and it was just too powerful. Most of the time you'd probably still focus on it because it exposes at level two. But, um, but Reign of Arrows allowed you to say, hey, I want to kill this, I'm going to kill it faster. And there wasn't really a lot of competition for that. And I know as you level up, blah, 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 blah. But the whole point is, is those are primarily the two things you would just use. You would not have a lot of Doom variety. And you would just come up with ways to use top action, non-loss top actions. And occasionally burn some losses to just blow up stuff when you could. Because you had a 12 hand size. So unfortunately it's taken a nerf now. But I don't think that's a big deal. We have a little bit more clarification on what Dooms can target and they don't count as conditions, but also more importantly, now Dooms can be put on objectives. This is pretty significant in first edition where a lot of obstacles with health would just kind of screw over the Doom Stalker. And I'm glad that we at least have a fix now because it was really annoying to have, well, this scenario, you just suck because of an arbitrary ruling. No more. But now we have at least some build diversity as well. I personally enjoyed playtesting alongside Sam. We had a high level test some time ago, I was playing the new two minis, and he was playing a high-level uh, Doom Stalker with summon build, and I was like, "Oh, this is cool!" But um, he would just—he could bust out a lot of damage with. I thought you were like, you know, the Doom Stalker. You put out Dooms, you kill stuff, and like you're a big sniper. But like he basically was playing similar to like a World of Warcraft uh, hunter or like. Those, those, the rangers from D and D, where you kept like pets. I'm like, this is cool, but like it's optional. You don't actually have to do that pets because I've seen the build played without them, and it works functionally well. It's cool to have two very distinct builds and have them both feel tangibly great. So let's at least just jump into the cards, though. Now that we at least understand two core concepts, and you have of course some hybrid options here. So first, we're gonna at least talk about a couple dooms that we're familiar with, two I already mentioned, and see how different they are. But something to note, these dooms are just part of your toolkit. So, Reign of Arrows. Uh, part of this toolkit, it's not as great as it was before, but still really good. Add Pierce 2 to all your attacks is huge against certain enemies with Shield 2 or greater. This one's literally as good as it was before, which is insane, because that, that was already too good. And now it's too good, but only situationally. But also the Anish 9 is still incredibly good undercut. But the top is now a interesting loss in the next four times a Doom enemy dies. If there is an enemy with a range four of you, you get a free three attack three on them. So it's like attack three range four situationally, but you have to kill Doom enemies to trigger it, which uh, equates to usually 12 damage or better which of course is a really good level one loss. Of course you have to trigger four tombs to get all that, but uh, it's, it's notably more fun. And back in the day, back in first edition, a lot of people just wouldn't want to lose the bottom of Reign of Arrows anyway, so why would you ever play the top except to like burn experience or do something at the end? But uh, this time, uh, both of them, I, I don't think losing the bottom, in some scenarios there's going to be enemies with no shield, but this is still valuable because the top action is a lot of damage. Race to the Grave, on the other hand, is a little bit more situational, but the bottom is basically universally good. It's no longer suffer two damage. Oh no, 
But it is, the target does still suffer one damage every turn. Uh, the interesting part, like someone's like, why doesn't it just wound the enemy permanently? Because wounds can be healed off, but also this can be combined with wound to make the target suffer two damage. So uh, it's cumulative. Uh, personally, I think this one's more universal. The 75 initiative is still pretty strong in terms of like going late. The top, on the other hand, uh, gives you the summon the Vicious Jackal. Something to note about the Vicious Jackal, some people might say, hey, this sucks. Uh, no, not necessarily. What you want to often do for the for the Doom Stalker build is you need to learn to protect your summons. A lot of times they're either throw away or you didn't care or they weren't worth protecting. This one is attack to wound is really strong. The retaliate is hard to get to use it, but um, the, this can still do. You can still have this depending on where you can push it, position it. Still do quite a bit of effort. Soak up some hits, but you are almost never going to want this thing to be being attacked. You're going to want to see if you can keep it alive, and uh, giving you an option for doing that. And by the way, if you're like, I don't want that option. I want a different. Guess what? Get a different summon. If this is the summon where if you keep it alive, this one is the damage. But you also have to pair it with the fact that that is a good damage doom. So if you do want to go good damage summon, you have to give up your good damage doom. It's almost like there's a choice that needs to be made here. And I like it. Got shot. Attack to range four, uh, which is okay. But if the target is doomed, which is really easy to do, wound them and gain an experience. So special shots targeting doomed enemies is one way you're going to be gaining experience and that's perfectly fine. But also that's just good. It's universally good. Very few enemies you're never going to want to non-wound. It's basically just like more damage. And the 21 initiative is really good too. But look at the bottom. The bottom's a move four, which is really good. So basically what this is, is this is a universally good card and you're going to be picking it every time. Of course, when you're like, hey, that's a good attack or that's a good move, you're going to have to figure out what's going to be the best use of it. And it may vary from rest cycle to rest cycle. Detonation, on the other hand, is actually a really cool doom because it doesn't do anything until the target dies, as per usual. And then boom, all enemies adjacent to the hex in which the target dies suffer two damage. This is actually pretty easy to set up because if you do need to doom an enemy that's already dead adjacent to others, this is really one really good way to splash damage, especially against enemies that uh, have high shield. That's been a pretty good use for this. Plus the eight initiative is crazy. But the top is just a nice loss. See, the thing is that's a pretty good bottom. But the top also gives you an attack for range for target two. So you can bust out two big attacks, you know, either early in the round if you really need the burst, or later. You have you have a hand size of 11, so you can really afford to actually burn some losses. Murderous Stalker, attack six range five, which is a pretty, that's that's a good level one loss. It's something you can save if it's got a good use, reusable bottom. But um, definitely something you can use. But if you kill the target with it, which, it, this is this is one of the more likely things to actually kill the target. You get to play a an extra card for free. The cool part is you can also play the extra card out of your discard. So sometimes playing an extra card causes you to burn out faster. Not in this case, but the bottom gives you a nice jump three. It's just kind of hard to complain about, hey, here's a jump three on an initiative 13. That's really good. But the top is really conditional, but really strong. This is a great card. Moments Peace, first off, 88. I think the biggest thing people are going to be sad about is Moments Peace used to allow you to heal self and then also have a pip on it that you could bless or strengthen yourself. Farewell, pip. Duh. I guess we're going to have a eulogy now for a Moments Peace. That's okay. It's still a great card. So instead of move two, heal two, it's move three, heal two, target one of your summons or yourself. That's really cool because if you do, if you are playing more of a support leader build uh, where you need to heal yourself or heal one of your summons, that works really well. But if you're like, I don't care about summons, healing yourself still good anyway. And the top is your loot. Uh, this allows you to move and loot so you can position yourself and still scoop stuff up. But instead of um, like just loot and do nothing, now you can actually get a little moment to look at what's coming up the next turn, reveal that information to your party, and you can better plan. An intended side effect that was noticed is sometimes people would loot, but then they'd like reveal a card that people would be like, hey, I'm going to loot these four coins. You bastard. Oh, by the way, here's the, oh, thank you. I can plan around that. Like the, you, you get forgiven for looting because you're going to give them free information. And then you can just loot more and more. And just saying that's power. The hunt begins is really good. Attack to a range force, fine. But you know what? 
Attack 4, range 4, what experience against undamaged targets? Whew. Oh, that's a good, that's just, that's just a good card. That's just a good card. Also, I love the theme of it. The hunt begins like, ah, there's just something about it that makes me feel fuzzy inside. I love it. But the bottom is cool. You know how you really like, kind of wish, man, I wish I could tell my summons what to attack. You can do it now. And not can, only can you tell your summons what to attack, they hit it harder. As long as that subject is alive, your summons will ignore other things, run right towards this, and try to murder it with plus one on all of their attacks. That's a very good doom. The best part about this is, if you are a sniper, that top is insane. But if you're going for the summoner, the bottom's incredible. It's got good uses for both builds. And e and even if you are like uh, some kind of trying to do a hybrid thing, they both have good uses. This is just a good card. Summon focus doom is very different, but like, you know, like, oh, against undamaged enemies. Yeah, it already had that in its toolkit. It's still good. It's still here. And we just like love the fact that it remained. Solid bow. If you'll notice, rip the experience on it. Attack three, range five remained, but now the experience is gone. Still a good card, but on the other hand, we've lost the good move, and instead we've gotten a doom for the rest of the scenario, as long as this doom's on that target. Whenever you or one of your summons damages the enemy, heal to self or one ally adjacent to the target. The interesting part is if you do have high health summons, which we'll get to those in a bit, they can actually hit the enemy, heal too, heal the, keep themselves up. So as long as they're only taking like a minimal amount of damage, some summons can keep themselves alive with this. Not only that, but if you're taking hits, you can keep yourself alive with this. This one can get so much value. Or you can attack enemies and heal like your tanky brute that you've got supporting you. Just there's, you get more creative with the ways you can protect your summons or protect your allies. And this card, enables so much more now the problem is this is all recovery and reactive and the best part of gloomhaven is like you know killing enemies so even even though i'm saying numerically this wins it's despite the fact it can numerically win reactive and healing is always worse than uh it's not always worse than but you usually will want to try to punch things out more. So the reason why the number, so the reason why the numbers are better aren't arbitrary, but this one can go a long way if you're playing more of a later build. Foot snare in ish fourteen. Yeah, the Doom Stalker in every aspect is so capable of doing really good initiative undercuts. Just looking at the bottom, mobilize an adjacent enemy. This is actually really cool if you're like. Uh, being more of a leader defender and being the front line and move away. Fantastic. Even then, initiative 14, move 3 is fine, even if you ignore the immobilize. But the top is actually super useful. Attack 2, range 4, which is fine, but gain an experience and immobilize if they are doomed. Inish 14 means that you'll go more than most enemies and you can always immobilize them. If you do immobilize them, especially on melee attacks, you can often avoid getting hit. Now, of course, you have to coordinate with your group and say, hey, I'm going to mobilize that guy. Don't run on it. You're going to have to get used to communicating. That's the very important part. But it's really strong. Forward momentum. Um, oh, joy. So it's a non-loss persistent forever, but any dooms you have on the target, instead of, like, putting the dooms in your discard pile, you can now bounce them over to other enemies within range three keeping them in play now if you just want to keep on doing a doom train that's really strong but keep in mind depending on where you are with your rests the doom train can actually kind of hurt your stamina i know you have hand size of 11 and you can probably work with that i just want to make a note of that however uh, depending on the scenario maybe you do need m moving things from one enemy to the next that's, that's significant, especially because it can add more damage, cause you to have more impact. It might, in the long run, yield more. So, it's up to you. Worst case scenario, you can deliberately let it fall off and play this card again. But on the other hand, it's an initial love and move four. So even if you don't want that effect, guess what? You've got a good move on a good initiative. Um, yeah, the Doomstalker is way too good at these really good early initiatives. It's great. Hidden Danger, plus one to all your attacks targeting this enemy doom. 
It's the mind's weakness. It's uh, the new mind's weakness. It's the new uh, reign of arrows. It's just that for it. Doesn't matter what build you are, that doom is generally going to be useful to no matter what. Now, some people are like, wait, you can actually run a summon. I know, you don't actually need to run a summon build that does a lot of the shooty bow stuff. You can do other stuff. Yeah, I'm very aware. You're probably still going to do some attacks, but that's okay. But even then, if you're like, well, I'm going to be doing a summon build, look at the other side of this. The damage on the green snake is strictly worse than the jackal. The jackal wins. Sad. Except the jackal, uh, you know, they still only both do attack twos. But the jackal also has retaliate one, and the jackal also wounds on attacks. So what's the big difference here? This one has one more health, which adds a little bit to its survivability. But the big thing is this is unaffected by difficult terrain, and it counts as being last for focus. This is really interesting because sometimes if you want to be on the front line more, take hits with your Doomstalker, you can actually let this go up. And if you and your normally when you and your summon are equidistant to the enemy, they'll attack your summon. This one will attack you and ignore the snake. That means this snake is very easy to protect. That means that this snake can be protected by your allies. You can constantly have it chuck out attack twos. And it's going to have always go last in terms of focus for monster priority. So as long as there's something equidistant, it's very easy to protect. And in the case that there is some multi-attack, it does have five health. This does mean this is one of the more easiest summons to protect. It means you'll have reliable two damage. It's a strong card. The top is a good strong summon, the bottom is a good strong doom. It's hard to just not pick this card. But we always feel like a lot of the cards here. Now of course the, some of these are less situational. I feel like this is generally more universal. Now we're in the X cards, give chase. First off, 80 initiative with 4 move is good. Um, you don't need to bring all those good moves, but this is one of those that it doesn't really matter what. And a late initiative good move is always good to bring to the toolkit. But the top is really interesting in the fact that all of your summons get jump and move to and focus this target. Generally harder to utilize, especially on a top doom. Uh, especially that you need summons where you're going to actually make use of this. And they need to, like, somehow need to get in position. But in the case that they do, very impactful. Especially if they need to get to some far away thing and you can like initiative wave get the summon over there or if they, they need mobility or if you need to like you know tell your pokemon to go to a specific thing don't worry it's a good tool but i'm not entirely sure that this is something it's not going to be brought to every scenario but at the very least even though that that is a very situational top the move four is generally something you're always going to want to bring anyway so at least that's great feral aid so another more summony build attack two range four and then plus two attack and an experience if a summon's adjacent to it. Oh, non less attack four for the summon build is so good. Uh, attack four, rage four. This is so strong. Uh, definitely one of the stronger cards. Of course, you're like, I need to have a summon adjacent to it. Trust me, it's really not that hard. Uh, this is definitely with the boar, which we'll talk about in two seconds. And the, um, the snake. Very easy to pull this off. It's a really good... This is just a really good attack. Obviously, if you're going the sniper shooter build... Uh, the attack sucks, but let's look at the bottom. The bottom is an attack four at range four. If this attack now brings them to four or fewer health, one of your pets can now move three, attack three, and the attack can only target that. So I know it's kind of very specific, but the amount of damage that this loss can punch out is really strong in terms of burst damage. Now, there's definitely other cards like, you know, the top of Reign of Arrows, which has more overall potential. But this one, that's going to take over more often four or more different turns. And this is a significant amount of damage potentially loaded on a bottom action in one turn. This does require the enemy to be able to be hit and be able to drop to four health. And then for you to have a summon within range, like there's way more situations, but ultimately it still has its uses because the top is something you're going to want to bring on a summon build anyway. So this ends up being a great card. It's definitely an X because if you don't have the summon setup, the card is crap. I mean, it's not crap, but it's just outclassed by others' cards. And last, Fierce Fighter. Although this is an X, that bottom card, it, the sniper build loves the bottom of this anyway. It's not a doom, but advantage on all attacks this round is really strong. Uh, and even then, like the, the summoner can kind of go that way, but ultimately, the top is just strong. Move to attack two is great 
and this is one of my more favorite ones. When attacking, this ignores retaliate. The move two is a bit of a penalty because like the other two summons it has has move three, so this one's gonna be less in position, but it does have seven health, it does ignore retaliate. So this is one of your best, this is your tanking summon if you didn't, I hope you figured that out, but if you didn't, this seven health can take hits. You can then use some of your dooms or other abilities to keep this alive and watch as this one, you can just do a little bit of damage. Your allies can do a little bit of damage. Uh, chip away and heal up and this is something you can keep alive now uh it's clearly not like going to compete with like a bruiser that's going defensively obviously but uh, in the case that you do need a body that can take hits while still actually uh doing some decent sustained damage this is your card relentless offensive for so that beastmaster build this is it attack two at range force fine but uh, you also grant a summon an attack plus zero so you get to do an attack two and often an attack two if you are playing the jackal this is an attack two attack two wound giving two uh, modifier draws to it and usually when you level up more draws is better than like combining the numbers and then you get an experience all you have to do is have an, an, a summon next to the target you want to kill which is good Ultimately, this ends up adding to a pretty decent amount of damage. And the bottom is grant a summon move plus zero, attack plus zero, move plus zero, attack plus zero. It's pretty good, uh, especially if you need to do some cleanup. Uh, I do like the fact that you have a very... Um, that bottom is something you're not going to want to do all the time. And the initiative of 63 is harder to use, but the attack is great. You already have some good bottom initiatives. Like There's just too many initiatives anyway that you're, you probably don't need to worry about one card being a little out of place. Dual shot, on the other hand, basically the sniper build. So this is a little bit more divisive in terms of like, uh, are you going heavily? I, I think the hybrid builds will be a little bit more divided here, but if you're like, I wanna shoot enemies down, you're gonna take this. But it's an attack two, range five, which is great, but it's target two, so you can shoot down enemies. But you're like, okay, but what if I don't need AOE? Well, the bottom is advantage on everything and then curse the enemy deck once you finally kill it. Really strong. Also, keep in mind that unless you get cursed that bottom says you are no proof until the enemy dies when shooting that guy if you weren't aware being no proof it, ah those are super annoying so just having one card bake into it that's good the initiative 52 sucks level three i first want to talk about swift trickery um it's an inish 10 move five if it wasn't obvious any build loves that I don't think it matters what you are. A niche 10 move 5 is good. And then attack 2, range 4, and then plus 2 attack if the target is doomed. By far the easiest if the gain 2 attack in one experience. So as a result, this is basically almost always attack 4, range 4, gain an experience. Unfortunately, it's pretty easy to set up the other attack 4, range 4, gain an experience at level 1. So. This one doesn't feel as good, but hey, it still it doesn't matter. The bottom of the card's good, the top of the card's solid, but it does compete with Walking Bastion, which is not as universal, but let's stick into it. Summon Staunch Garilov. Now, it's not, it's like the tanky summon of uh, Ye old of level one. It has move two, attack two, but this one does have pierce three, which is substantial. Uh, but it only has eight health, which is still good, but it's one only one more health than this, the uh, base summon. But this gains ward when you summon it, and then every time you long rest, it gains ward. That adds, <laughs> that adds up a way more tanky than you expect it to be. Um, the Garilov is pretty significant in terms of what it can soak up. It can push out a bit of damage, especially depending on what you're fighting. If you're fighting like, oh god, living spirits. Dude, I didn't, can't believe how good this is. Um, but uh, again, not every, not every even summoner is going to go for this. But the bottom, if you haven't found this out, there's several some, there's several cards that say your summons will focus on this enemy. Uh, but once per round, you can trigger a attack one, pierce two, for free, as long as like you know summon blah blah. You know, it's just free attacks. This one is definitely if you need to burst out damage. Keep in mind, due to the nature of drawing modifiers and leveling up, drawing more is generally better. So it's like, well, it's only one attack one. Well, attack one can very easily become twos and threes, uh, especially with this class. But you're like, well, you know what? What if you're fighting shielded enemies? Great. It's got pierce two on it. So unless they have shield three or more, 
This is very easy to punch out two or three free damage. This is one of your best summon dooms for raw damage output. You're going to get a lot of use out of it. So the top is very good if you need something to soak hits and get another cool summon in play. The bottom, on the other hand, is really good if your summons need to punch out damage. Really nice. Camouflage. Like, oh no, did we nerf it? The answer is yes, it's nerfed. I, I don't think anyone expected it to be. Anyway, it's attack two, range four. And then you have to, you don't just get invisibility. You have to be adjacent to a wall to get invisibility. And then you lose invisibility at the end of the round. But in ish six, invis self is really good. Oh, you have to be, just, just be adjacent to a wall. <sighs> Camouflage. It's good. Invisibility was too strong in first edition anyway. So like not enough to complain about that. And the bottom is it, hold on. Let's just look at that. In ish six, move four, uh, attacking your summons have disadvantage. Like... Inish 6, move 4. Already pretty solid. It's not scoundrel good, but that's solid. Summon, attacking your summons have disadvantage. Ah, so good. This is what we love to see. So, way to protect your summons. It's really strong. Also, preventing your summons from getting crit is super big, because that's basically a death sentence to any summon, especially at this level. Coded arrows. This is cool, because this gives you uh, special abilities. Your next arrow poisons, then your next one wounds, then your next one immobilizes, then your next one disarms. You get an experience on the fourth arrow, and then this falls off. That's just kind of neat, because it gives you like a cool toolkit of arrows to shoot on things. Also, because of the nature of things, this isn't necessarily bad to bring for a summon build either, because you can definitely want to just put out debuffs on enemies, especially poison, which you get a lot more use out of them. And that's your first arrow. This, of course, requires one downtime turn. But again, like the sniper is probably going to be more, more focused on downtime terms, where the summon doesn't care. The summoner is going to say, hey, during my downtime terms, my summons still get to go. So a one setup turn for, to set up a top like this isn't going to mean as much. But the bottom is actually really cool, especially for the sniper build, because uh, now you get plus two to all of your attacks targeting doomed enemies. Which is just good, because it's like a way to stack a, a doom on top of other dooms. Especially if you're like, hey, I have plus one to all my attacks uh, targeting this doomed enemy, and now I have plus two to all my attacks targeting doomed. So you can just add three, then like, hey, plus two. Yeah, you can do that. This can punch out the damage. And this isn't a hard combo to pull off. And that's the cool part. You can set these up pretty easily. All you have to do is have the enemies within range and do some setup, and there's absolutely the payoff for it. Felling Swoop. All right, so jump five and ish 93. Thank you. That's good enough. But let's talk about the summon. Attack three is your first attack three on a summon, which is good. Uh, it does have fly, which means it's kind of immune to like traps and hazards and other annoying stuff that might screw with other summons, which is important. But the fact that it has move five, hold on, fly five is, it sounds really strong, but I want to do a word of caution to people who think that the summon is going to be amazing. First off, it is, but you have to learn to protect it because it will fly right at enemies and potentially put itself in perilous situations. What this means is you just have to be a little smart and learn when to place things, how to position things, when to like call things back because you can your summons can still focus you now. So just be careful. This one has good damage, it has good movement, it can avoid some really annoying things. Like, you know, hey, the snake can avoid uh, difficult terrain. That's great that the snake avoids difficult terrain. This avoids everything. This can fly over, like, its own, and you can, this can fly over enemies. Especially if you're like, hey, I'm gonna doom that enemy over there, all summons have plus one on it. Boom, jump over there, attack four. That's huge. But the, th the funny part about that is, keep in mind, if you make an enemy all the way over there doomed and everything else, that, like that's the only thing you can focus, potentially you have this like bird over there fighting a thing while everything else fights up there. That's, as long as you can try to try to keep that alive, do whatever you can, you can distract annoying enemies from afar or even deal with them. If you're like, hey, there's this cultist summoning over there, go kill it, fly over all these other things and start killing it. Value, just value. Expose is back uh, at level five, speaking of expose, uh, but it's at level five, it's at level two. And some people are like, all right, what did we nerf? Nothing. <laughs> it's, it's, it's what it was before. It's too experience. It's uh, enemies can't turn invisible. It's you have advantage on your first attack targeting a doomed. It's advantage, it's invisibility, it's too experience. Countering invisibility, 
doesn't add up to that much. The big thing you wanted to do is get advantage once around. But advantage once around just for dooming enemies is significant. Uh, however, pushing it to level 5 means that it's n it must compete with the level 5 or higher choices. But you have Fierce Warrior and you have Dual Shot. And both of those give you advantage. So advantage is still very valuable, but because you have other things in your toolkit, it's not as valuable as it could be. So this card goes from a mandatory pick to a good pick. And that's something we like to see. The bottom of Exposed, though, is great for the Summoner build. So the Summoner build really has a tough decision because you have that bird, which is great. But also, you have the ability to say, hey, my summons auto wound and have advantage against targeting that enemy. That's just strong. That's damage. That's power. But it doesn't cause them to focus it. So you're still, if you do want them to focus another enemy, yeah, there's... There's other things. Obviously, if you have multiple summons out, wounding the same thing over and over isn't always that. So it doesn't have as innate value. as like, oh, my summons have wound. Great. Wounding against this thing. So it's almost like a delayed wound, but giving all your summons advantage to target this thing is still very strong. So don't get me wrong. This is a good doom. I do really like that bird. But again, it requ this, this doom is easier to use than that bird. So... There's that. I'm sure Sam will correct me on this at some point as well. So let's take a look at the perks though. Uh, replacing a minus two with a plus zero is pretty significant, but there's not much to say about that. My one of the one of the parts I really love about this is the machine gun. You've kind of got this machine gun perk now. Uh, the minus one gets replaced by minus one. So you're like, well that sucks. Yeah, it kind of does. But instead, your uh, Doom Stalker now does turning its minus ones into get a free attack to range five a free attack to range five is notably better than turning that to a plus one in almost every situation so this is definitely cooler in most situations than replace a minus one with a plus one in many situations it sure it's going to be the same but in several situations this is going to just pan out better and we love that uh -huh. I just love this. But also adding a plus zero, but that also says that give a summon a free attack. That's usually, it's it's harder to use. And I think most, some Doomstarkers aren't going to like it. But it's almost better than like uh, adding plus threes because of how this can actually stack up. Especially if you can cause stuff to, uh, you know how I was like talking about the, 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 the minigun. You can actually have some of these draw more attacks. I need to ask, uh, see what the, the record is on how many attacks drawn in a round because... I'm pretty sure that the Doomstalker could just get such a volume of attacks, which we love. And then being able to upgrade the zeros to ones is really universal, obviously. Adding plus threes is universal, obviously. Rolling stuns are really, really, really important for summons. I, I, I know the sniper obviously is cool, but when you are rolling, the summon build just rolls a lot of attacks. So being able to do rolling stuns and being able to better protect your summons is significant. Plus stuns are really powerful. I know that rolling one, rolling modifiers are unpredictable and stun on random is unpredictable, but it does, this card still, it's still a very valuable perk. First off, ignore scenario effects and add plus one is normal, but ignore scenario effects and add a rolling one, we love that. Ignoring scenario effects is really good. Uh, there's a little bit more diversity in Gloomhaven 2nd Edition. There's a lot of like, here, add three minus ones or add three curses, and they weren't super common. They're more common now, but they're usually less bad than three curses. But because they're more common now, I definitely think this is one of your early picks. At the start of the scenario, look at one monster's ability card before you... Like, that's just strong. Being able to, like, say, hey, that... Especially if you're like, okay, are those cultists summoning? Are those cultists going to be doing something annoying? What are the oozes doing? Like, just starting a scenario and knowing what one thing is. Like, okay, well, they're not doing this or they are doing this. You can plan around that. That's just powerful. And obviously, not every scenario this is going to pay off. But, like, sometimes you add a plus three, and not every scenario you draw it. So, just saying. The, then you have the fun Doom build. Uh, once per, uh, whenever you long rest, and you can scoop your discard pile. And then when you do, toss a Doom out, which is great. It just, it's a free, you can freely play an extra Doom just when you long rest, which is great. This one, I'm going to also point out, this is a stamina hit. But that's okay. Because, like, Ring of Haste is a stamina hit, and I think it's one of the best items in the game. 
So stamina hit, but worth it. And last but not least, we have, you can tell your summons, no, don't do your turn. Do move plus zero, move towards me. Some people, well, then it loses its attack. And if there's no monsters, they can do this anyway. Correct. But you can use this to save summons from dying. This can be a way to like, come, come towards me, come towards me, come towards me. All right, now do it. You can kind of hold things into check until you need them. And especially important if you can like drop a doom on a thing that causes monster focus to change and then have them actually position themselves. So this one seemed a little weak at the start, but it actually has a lot of utility and I love that. But zoom, but the zoo doom, zoom? I'm gonna call it Zoom Stalker. The Zoo the zoo Stalker is one of the more interesting builds in my opinion, but obviously not for everyone. Personally, I think that the this new experience for it, um, I think there's a lot of people who are going to try to uh, play a more different role. I still think most people are going to lean heavily into Striker or just full Striker, but you can have a little bit more of a support role and uh, you can even almost act as a defender role or a support role or a hybrid defender support. There's just a lot you can do. So, um, just the fact that we have all these varieties personally, obviously through everything you've heard from me talking this whole video, if you've gotten this far, clearly I realize that I've expressed that this cl class can now do a lot now, and that's something I love. So, uh, what build path are you most interested in? Are you, do you like the changes? If you do, what's your favorite card? Let me, let me know. Uh, and if you want to hear any other things, uh, what can I shout to Cephal Affair to say, hey, I want to see this? Because because I do shout that out. I don't shout it. I do message them, though. It's very quiet, though. I just kind of... Actually, it is pretty loud because I have a mechanical keyboard. So it's 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 a loud keyboard. So I, I guess it is pretty shouty. Mechanical keyboards are pretty shouty. But yeah, just let me know what you want to see. And we'll see if we can get you hooked up. But uh, yeah... Thank you, everyone. This is, I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you to all my patrons. I should update Patreon a bit more. I know I've, I get, had a little bit of an idea. And thank you for letting me uh, pick the next class. We are actually almost done writing that class guide. I just retired that class, actually, so that's really cool. Thank you for picking that. So it's kind of fresh in my head. So that's going to be Meteor, by the way. Um, so thanks, patrons, for voting for that. I'm going to uh, finish up that guide shortly. I've got... I've tried to mostly add other uh, builds for it, but that's pretty cool. So if you do want to join Patreon, uh, you do get to vote on what the next Frosthaven class guide is, and you do get a little bit of early access. Also access to the Patrons channel and Discord, where I do give a little bit more regular updates. So uh, thank you all, our next patrons. You're all amazing, of course, and thank you so much. And thanks all of you for watching.